This is the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is now a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and each episode I interview authors about their latest works or others in the book world about their roles, what those roles entail, and the books they love. For more book recommendations, check out my earlier episodes and my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Thoughts from a Page. Thanks to Maggie Garza of HTX Real Estate Group for sponsoring my podcast. Today, I am interviewing Elizabeth Passarella about Good Apple. Elizabeth is a magazine writer and a former editor at Real Simple, Vogue, and In Style. She is currently a contributing editor at Southern Living. She is originally from Memphis, Tennessee, but has lived in New York City for 22 years. She and her husband are raising three kids in a two-bedroom apartment. I really loved this conversation with Elizabeth, and I hope you enjoy it as well. Before we get started, I am really excited to tell you about my latest sponsor, The Young Center, here in Houston. The Young Center is delighted to present author and producer Delia Efron on October 5th at their 2021 Fall Benefit, Who's in Your Inbox? Delia Efron talks about life, change, and the relationships that matter. You know Delia's work. With her sister Nora, she co-wrote You've Got Mail and co-produced Sleepless in Seattle. Delia's newest book, coming out in April, is Left on Fifth, A Second Chance at Life. In it, she describes her story of falling in love after the death of her husband and sister, being diagnosed with cancer, and living through it all with humor and grace. To register, go to younghouston.org and click on Delia Efron. I've included a link in the show notes. You will get $10 off your ticket when you write thoughts from a page in the notes. I am personally planning to attend online, and I hope to see you there as well. Welcome, Elizabeth. How are you today? I'm doing great, Cindy. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you about Good Apple. And the timing works so well because I just moved my daughter into college in New York City. And so I was just up there. And so as I read your book actually while I was there, and it was just so much fun to kind of put some of that stuff in context and think about the things that I love about New York City and some of the things that make it a little different from where I live in Texas and everything. So I just thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, that makes me so happy. And welcome to New York, to your daughter. That's really exciting. It's nice to have people who aren't native New Yorkers back in the city again, whether that's students or tourists. We're just happy for people to be back (laughs) after a very long year and a half. I was so happy to be back because we usually regularly go a couple times a year. And so it had been the longest time that I hadn't been there since college, I think. And I just kept saying over and over again to my daughter, I'm so happy to be here. And she's like, I know, mom. (laughs) A different energy about New York City, and it's not really replicated anywhere else. And the sounds all night long and all the lights and the big buildings. And I just was thrilled to pieces to be back. And I'm so glad that I'll have a reason to visit regularly. Yes. I love that you say the sounds at night and the big buildings that so often those are the things that people complain about. But those are things that I love about New York too, for sure. I can't sleep when I go home to Memphis and It's quiet and there's no traffic or no sirens. And I love the big buildings. Those are some of my favorite sort of things about looking around the skyline of New York and seeing all the skyscrapers. So that warms my heart to hear you say that. Yeah, it's funny. And then we popped over to Brooklyn to go to Books Are Magic. And just in that part of Brooklyn, everything was so short, like, you know, two story buildings. And I was like, oh, this is so funny because you, you kind of picture what you know about a place. And so I've only ever really gone to Manhattan over and over. And so I thought, Brooklyn, and people say that, but Brooklyn is so different. And it was just kind of interesting. And it makes you understand why different people pick different areas. But it was just a surprise to me because I kind of think of Manhattan as all of New York City. Yes. And well, that's one of the things I think I love the most about Manhattan or New York City in general is that every, even different neighborhoods in Manhattan, but especially when you go to different boroughs, it feels like a different city. When I go to Brooklyn, I almost feel like maybe I'm in Boston. Or I'm in a you know in another kind of small small city that's more brownstones and fewer high rises and that's what I love about New York is that you can go 30 blocks and feel like you're in a really different uh, environment and even the the vibe of the people is a little bit different or the restaurants that you encounter are a little bit different and so it keeps it it keeps it fresh and interesting interesting if you live here you feel like you get to explore different little environments just by going a few blocks. That's one of the things that actually stuck with me about your book. You talk about when you and your husband, I think it's when you were first dating or were kind of trying to decide whether you were going to keep dating and you would drive around Manhattan, the outer edge of it, and every 20 blocks, the city would change. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a great way to describe it. 
Yes. And this is, this is a, a part in our relationship where we had actually broken up. We were young. We started dating when I was 23 and he was uh, 22. We had just graduated from college and I had decided that we were not meant to be, that he was not the kind of man that I was supposed to marry. And I promptly broke up with him about four months after we started dating or six months after we started dating. And then I would go out on other dates with other people and I would miss him and I would call him and tell him about the, this horrible date or this boring date that I'd been on. And at the time, my husband who grew up in New York City and he had a car, which is something I didn't think anybody had when I moved to New York City. I thought everyone just moved around the city in taxis or public transportation and that was it. I did not realize that plenty of New Yorkers, tons of people who live here and my family now, we have a minivan of all things. We have an enormous minivan. So a lot of people in New York have cars. They park them on the street. Some people pay for a garage. We do not. We park our cars on the street. But my husband had a car. He had this old beat up Jeep Cherokee that he had had forever. The air conditioning didn't work. It smelled awful. And he would come pick me up. And we would, as very angsty and romantically challenged 23-year-olds who have broken up and are deciding whether or not to get back together do, we would fight and cry and you know be sad and, and argue and try to figure out what to do about our relationship. And we thought we were so old and we thought we were so mature and we were just wrestling with the, with the great problems of life. And he would drive around the perimeter of Manhattan while we were having these incredibly deep discussions. And I was crying and he was wondering what he had done wrong, which was nothing. So we would drive around the perimeter of Manhattan and we would go down the West Side Highway and we would go up the FDR. And that was at the beginning. I'd only lived in New York a little over a year. And so that was how I really started to understand just the geographic layout of New York, where the bridges that crossed the East River and the Hudson River all went, <laughs> what connected to them on the other side and how the tip of Manhattan looked, because that was a part of Manhattan that I didn't go to that often. So it was... I say in the book, I fell in love. I fell back in love with him. I fell in love with the city. I fell in love with sort of, we were all tangled up together in those, in those moments. And we did end up getting back together a few months later. But yes, those were incredibly dramatic, as you can imagine, and also really life-giving evenings to me, or not even evenings. They were probably early, early mornings. It was probably one o'clock in the morning when we were doing this, but he would come pick me up. And yes, we would drive around Manhattan for hours and process the ins and outs of our breakup. But it was, it was a really memorable time in our, in our life and our relationship. And a great way to learn the city. Yes. Yes. One of the things I usually ask someone to do is give me a quick summary of their book. So I know we kind of got started talking about New York and how much we both love it, but why don't I back up a bit and ask you that so people that haven't read your book can understand exactly what you're writing about. Okay. So my book is called Good Apple and it is a collection of essays. So it is, I, I would not describe it as a memoir, even though I certainly talk, uh, it, it is about my life and I certainly talk about the circumstances of my life and some childhood stories and through my marriage and some parenting things and living in New York and raising a family here. But it is really a collection of essays. And so they can all kind of stand alone. You can bounce around as you read. But they all, I would say, have a thread running through them of, I grew up in a pretty, in a Southern town. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, in a pretty conservative, you know, very uh, Christian home. Although my dad was Jewish. So it wasn't a typical Christian home that I think you would think about in the Bible Belt of the country. But the essays have a lot to do with who I became after I graduated from college and moved to New York and the changes that happened in my life from a faith perspective. I am still, I still identify as a Christian, but my faith did change and grow because of living in a different environment, living in New York City as opposed to living in the Bible Belt. My politics changed. So I talk a little bit about going from this very Republican household to being a Democrat now in New York, a pretty liberal New Yorker, but also keeping my faith intact which I think is really the crux of the book is that I am a Southerner, I'm a Christian, and I think that most New Yorkers you would meet would think about those two things and have a certain stereotype that comes into their head. And I don't really fit that stereotype. And then I think from the South's perspective, I am a New Yorker and politically I lean a little bit left and I'm raising my children in New York City. And so from that perspective, people have a stereotype that they think about that someone's going to fit in a certain mold. And I don't fit that mold either. So because I am a, a, you know, a strong Christian and I talk a lot about my faith in the book. And so that is really the, the lens, I guess, that I look through all these different life experiences. And so I talk about parenting. I talk about marriage. I talk about crazy things that have happened in my life in New York City, living in a New York City apartment. 
And, and it's funny. I really hope the book is funny. My goal was that it would make people laugh, that it would give them a little bit of a glimpse, whether they are someone who lives in the Northeast and ha- does not share a faith background that I do, or it's someone who really does share the sim- a similar background and grew up in the South, but doesn't really know what it's like to raise a family in New York, that each of those people would be able to look at the other side and maybe see something that resonates with them and realize we're, we have a lot more in common than we realize. That is a long description of, <laughs> of the book. But yes, it is It is just an essay collection about sort of my life in, in New York and growing up in the South. Well, it's definitely funny. I really enjoyed it. And I know I laughed a lot. So that part is definitely true. And the other thing that stuck with me a couple different times was something that I have noticed myself a lot and actually even just talked to my kids about some is how the Republican Party has almost co-opted Christianity and the flag. You don't talk about the flag part of it, but I feel like both of those things have been co-opted by the Republican Party. And I just can't quite figure out how they have gone so hand in hand. Like, I mean, I'm a Christian, I'm a Democrat. And so it's just kind of frustrating to me that that's something that, especially since 2016, I think, but probably even before that, there's been this split and somehow one party has co-opted some of these things that I think both parties really identify with. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it is so frustrating. And I think that there are more of us out there than we realize. Like you said, there are, I have plenty of friends who are Christians. I grew up in a really evangelical, I mean, I went to a church called First Evan, First Evangelical Church in Memphis. So, I mean, I grew up in a very evangelical background. I don't identify as an evangelical now precisely because even though you know, theologically, my, my beliefs align, I think, what traditionally evangelical meant, but it doesn't really matter anymore because, like you said, that term especially has been so co-opted by the Republican Party and has become a real, it's just a word that has a meaning that I think it didn't, it, it didn't originally mean. It, I, I think it sort of is meaningless in a sense now anyway, because nobody really knows what that means. It's become such a political term. But, you know, part of the reason I wanted to write this book is that I think there are more of us out there who are Christians, but do not let our faith take a second place or take a back seat sort of to our allegiance to a political ideology or our allegiance to our country even. You know, the fastest growing groups of Christians are not in the United States. They are in in Asia and Africa and even in Afghanistan, where we just left. I mean, there are so many growing underground churches there. So I think what I wanted to put out in this book is that there are a lot of us out there. And I think it's a good reminder to me. It's a good reminder to me every day, but it's a good reminder to all of us that our faith is 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 over all of it. And then all those other things are secondary. I think the problem is that the culture wars of our country right now have made the politics almost equal with our faith or over our faith. And that sort of those things, like you said, go hand in hand. And I think truly, if we are people of faith who are trying to be more like Jesus, there are going to be parts of the Republican platform that we agree with. And there are going to be parts of the Republican platform that we vehemently disagree with. And there's going to be parts of the Democratic platform that we agree with. And there's going to be parts of the Democratic platform that we vehemently disagree with. And we should be able to be people who are not identified as 100% one or the other. Um, So yes, I'm a registered Democrat and I'm very proud and easily can say that. But do I agree with everything they stand for? No. And there are things that the Republican Party does that I agree with, of course. But those those have got to be decisions that are secondary to my faith and um, so it is, it is very, very frustrating that those things have become on an equal, equal playing field for a lot of people. And I think it's really damaging. I think it's damaging to our message as Christians and our ability to go out in the world and try to uh, love people more like Jesus. It has really become a roadblock to that. So I wanted to also write this book to sort of speak to people like you or anybody who might be saying, I am a Christian, but I'm having a really hard time with my home church and the way that their message feels political, or they are sort of trying to shoehorn everybody into a certain ideology. And I wanted to let people know that there are people out there like me who don't really necessarily fit a mold, who are sort of dancing between two worlds or feeling a little bit, a little bit like a fish out of water, and that you're not alone. And that even though the country is trying to make it seem like it's so divided and one group has to vote this way and decide this way and think that way or whatever it is, that we're all human and we all have our own opinions. And it's okay to align with some beliefs on one side and some beliefs on the other. And that even though we're both Christians, we may have very different views of our Christianity and what we believe. And I think 
that is something that is being lost, not only with Christianity, but with many other things is that you don't have to just pick a party and be like, I believe everything they believe. I think it's really important that people continue to make sure they verbalize their individuality and their beliefs versus having to be just drugged behind. Absolutely. And the, the really hard thing, I think, is there is no middle ground anymore. There's no right. nuance. There's no gray. It's you're either 100% on one side or 100% on the other side, whether that's an issue or a political party or anything. And it's really difficult to, especially on social media, to start a conversation and say, I can see so-and-so's point here. I don't agree with them, but I can see their point. There's no allowances for that. You, you're not allowed to see somebody's point. If you're supposed to disagree with their point of view, you're not allowed to give them an inch. And that, I think, is just a really sad thing that has happened is that nobody can, can exist in that middle ground anymore. You can't see a little bit of both sides. You're not allowed to anymore. And I think that that is what's missing in our political conversations. I think that's what's missing with our politicians is the ability to work with the other side and, and compromise. You know, it's seen somehow as weak or damaging or it's diluting your position if you, if you even, you know, give an inch, like I said. So I think that that is really hard too. And I wish that we could have those conversations. And unfortunately, so many of the conversations are happening in the media or on social media and not face-to-face. I think when you're having conversations face-to-face, they tend to be a little bit better. But due to the fact that we're all attached to our phones and we've been in a pandemic where we haven't been meeting face-to-face as much as we normally would, those, um, those conversations just aren't happening quite as much. I think that's right. But I hope as the world is opening up that they begin to more. Yes, me too. Well, how did you decide to write the book? So I, I've been a magazine writer for 22 years and I love writing essays. I love writing personal essays. I love writing nonfiction. I think it had always been in the back of my mind that I would like to write a book but I was paying, paying the bills and, and freelancing and raising small children. And I am not a great multitasker, Cindy, at all. So I am either all in on one project or all out. I'm either I'm all in on one thing at a time. And so when I was working in magazines, it just, I'm not someone who gets up at 4 a.m. before my children and writes for two hours before they wake up. I've never had that ability. And so it just, it just got put on a back burner. And I think that a whole host of things lined up just in a very serendipitous way in the about three years ago, where my children are a little bit older and in school, I did have a baby. But babies, sometimes you can sort of ignore a little bit. He wasn't old enough to not ignore yet. So he was still young enough that I could sort of pass him off to somebody. But my older children were in school. My freelance work, I, I was able to take a little step back from that for a while. And I also have to credit my literary agent who was the editor-in-chief of Real Simple Magazine for many, many years. So I had worked with her at the magazine. Her name is Kristen Van Ogtrop, and she took a, a couple of years off from magazines and then started a new career as a literary agent. And she was looking for writers to, to have book proposals. And she reached out to me and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, of course I've thought about writing a book, but I haven't had time, or I, this excuse or that excuse. And so we sat down and I started just brainstorming things that I wanted to write about. And I've always been really passionate about writing about New York. I've always been really passionate about raising kids here. I think that's something that people, especially outside of New York, think is completely nuts. And she was the one who really encouraged me to bring in the whole of my personality, which can be a little overwhelming sometimes, but to talk about how I've changed as, as I've lived in New York for more than half of my life now, to talk a little bit about the politics, to really bring my faith into it talk about my upbringing um, in the church that I grew up with and, and how New York has shaped my faith. So she really encouraged me to just bring, bring it all to the table. And I just told my husband, I said, I'm going to take three or four months and write a book proposal. And I'm not going to take on any magazine assignments for right now. And he said, okay, go for it. And it just really took off. And I think when you start a project that all the doors seem to open in your brain, for starters, the writing came really easily to me. It was super fun. I had a great time. Everything was just enjoyable and it felt easy. And then on top of that, as we started to send this proposal out into the world, it really resonated with a lot of people. People were excited about it and thought it was fun. And it just felt, it felt really, really right. So as much as I would have loved to write a book when I was 25, and I would have, and I, I did start writing several different ideas for books, I think as a 40, I guess I was 42, maybe when I started writing this book, 43, as a 41, 42 year old, I, I do think I had a little bit more life experience and I had a little bit more to say. And 
I think this was the book that I was meant to write. So it took a little while to get there. I didn't, I think if you'd asked me when I was younger, how old will you be when you write your first book? I never would have said in my forties, but I think that I'm, I am much happier with this book than I probably would have been with a book that I'd written at 25. So yeah, all the, all the parts just came together, I think, in a, if, with the right timing. Well, at 25, you haven't really lived long enough to be able to write the book you've now written. I was going to write a book about how hard the first year of marriage is, which again is my husband probably would not have been happy. He loves to talk about how I thought our first year of marriage was so hard and he'll sometimes pipe up and say, uh, I was pretty happy. I thought it was fine. But uh, that was the book I really wanted to write. And I'm really thankful I didn't. Well, yes, because once you're married longer and you have children and everything, you're like, okay, that first year of marriage was a lot easier than some of these years have been. At least that's yes. what we find. Yes. <laughs> yes. We always look back and think we had so much time and we just didn't realize it. Oh my gosh. Yes. Amen. I mean, I think about all the times where I would wake up at 10 30, 11 in the morning, we'd watch TV or the news, we'd read the, co- the paper cover to cover. And we thought, oh, we've got a busy day. And it's just, you had no idea. So no idea at all, <laughs> but that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to be. I really liked the essay about living in New York city with children about, I think it's called like whatever the square footage of your apartment is, 1294 or whatever the, <laughs> the correct. 1241 square feet. Yeah. Okay. 1241 <laughs> square feet. Because I remember when I first started going to New York with my mom and sister and was right out of college. And so, you know, I didn't really pay attention to that kind of stuff. But once I had young children, I was always like, oh my gosh, what must it be like to have to get the stroller down the stairs and then cover up the baby when it's like freezing cold and get your groceries and do all of that? It must be really hard to raise young children. Now, of course, a lot has changed since then. Food delivery and grocery delivery and, you know, Some of those things are much more prominent than they were then. So I'm sure some of those parts that I worried about then aren't really an issue now. But still, you do talk about having to go to the park versus throwing them out in the backyard and some of those things. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because you must get asked that a lot based on that essay. Yes, yes. So we, those things, I have to say, when I had small children, grocery delivery was not really a big thing either. So I definitely lived, definitely lived through the years of hauling uh, children and groceries home. You know, it's, it's funny. I just recently met a really lovely woman who was a reader and had reached out to me because she and her three very young children, I think ages three and under three kids we're just moving to New York because her husband was starting law school. And I said to her, I think it is much harder. It's got to be much harder. And I have so much admiration for the bravery of parents who move to New York with children already. So they've lived somewhere else and then they moved to New York. I, my family grew organically here. We had all of our kids here. We were, we got married here. I've lived. And so I've never known raising children anywhere else. So I think that there's a little bit of ignorance is bliss. There is a little bit that my husband grew up here. So there are certain things that felt weird to me that are completely normal to him. And so whenever I would say, oh, but what about, you know, this, this or this? And he goes, well, when I was in third grade, I did X, Y, or Z, and it seems really normal. So I think that helped me a little bit. But yes, there are certain challenges in terms of you don't have, well, we do have a car, but on our day-to-day errands, of course, we are, yes, we are on foot. We are walking with strollers. We are carrying kids and ergos and going places. At the same time, I think if I had to get a kid in and out of a car seat every single time I stopped to run an errand, that seems really arduous to me. So I think it just is what we're what we're used to. The the thing that people I think are most, I guess, curious about is living in a small space and uh, kids sharing rooms. My youngest, my my three year old, lives in a closet. He sleeps in a very lovely walk in closet. And I would say that number one. My kids love sharing a room. I love that they share a room. I think that they are, they have learned certain lessons in terms of compassion towards each other, flexibility towards each other, and their sleeping uh, habits that they might not have learned otherwise. You do have to cut down on the stuff. Uh, When I go visit my sister who lives in a beautiful house in South Carolina and they have blow up paddle boards and kayaks and a million bikes. And I think, oh yes, we don't get to have these things. So I think that being someone, I am someone who really appreciates minimalism and throwing out things and purging a lot. 
you have to be very, I guess, amenable to that to live in New York. You just can't have a lot of stuff. But I like that. My house is pretty easy to keep clean. Everything has a place. It's pretty tidy. We just don't own a lot of extraneous things. And in terms of just walking around and taking public transportation, the thing that I love about New York is that my kids are constantly bumping up against, literally and figuratively, bumping up against our neighbors people in our neighborhood who are really different from us, people who are speaking different languages, people from different different countries, people who are of different socioeconomic status, everything. And I think that that is, it's in New York, you know, it's not that you can't get that in other cities. You can. There are so many wonderful, diverse pockets in cities all over this country. But in New York, if you are tempted to sort of cloister yourself in a bubble or surround yourself with friends who are very similar to you you almost can't. You have to sort of be out in the world and interacting with your neighbors constantly. So even as as I am want to do sometimes is sort of surround myself with people who think like I, like I do, look like I do, worship like I do, but I am almost forced, I am forced to just be around people, interact with people, talk with people on a daily basis who aren't. And I think that's what I really love about it. It can be hard for sure. When I am carrying a sweaty baby and also carrying groceries, and then I get upstairs and I have to turn on my window unit to get my AC going, it's hard. There are definitely challenges. But I think there's there's also a lot of ease in that. There is the fact that we have so many public parks and when we go, we almost always run into friends. There, are, You're never lonely. You're never isolated. There are things about New York that are really wonderful in that respect. So, And also we have elevators. Now, not everybody does, but I've always with children <laughs> lived in a building with an elevator. I do really sympathize with people who are carrying strollers and things up walk-ups and up flights of stairs. We have always lived in a building with an elevator since I've had children. And I have to say, that is very, very helpful. Yeah, I think that the, I think there are just trade offs. There's there's good and bad as there is with everywhere that you live. Just being out in the world and sort of being having to run into the, to people who are different and having to interact with strangers and treat them with kindness and compassion or just be be you know flexible and be able to compromise and be able to hold your temper in when you have to wait in a long line. Those are things that are really important to me, and I'm glad my kids are experiencing them. And I was reflecting on some of that this weekend when I was in New York, because I love the ability to walk everywhere, quickly hop on the subway to go 15 blocks and not have to pull the car out each time and then park and then walk. I mean, it's, you know, it's much better health wise to be walking everywhere. That is true. We do walk a ton. And yeah, and it's great. I love walking everywhere. I really do. I love seeing the city just experiencing it from a walking perspective. Now, listen, we have a car. As I mentioned before, we have a minivan. So we do drive places. We drive my my, da- my daughter to soccer practice. She, she plays soccer downtown and it's kind of far from our house. So we drive her a lot. We drive to dinner downtown sometimes. We drive out of the city to go to Home Depot or to go to <laughs> Ikea or wherever it is. So we do have a car. I think when you have kids in New York City, a car can be really, really helpful and just give you a little bit of an escape and freedom to get out of the city and get into the hills or the mountains or go to a pool or whatever it is. So I do think that that there, in some ways, we are more normal and more suburban and have some similarities to our friends in suburbia than people realize we do have a car. And we do go to Target and Home Depot and all of those things. But yes, I, for the most part, for our day to day, we walk. And even just my kids, you know, for example, getting to school, this is something that we are about to encounter when my children start school in another week and a half is I have a middle schooler. Uh, She'll be in sixth grade. And by the time kids get to middle school in New York, they walk to school by themselves. And I mean, and not by themselves, they're going with a gaggle of friends who all live in their neighborhood and they're all trucking up. Amsterdam Avenue to walk to middle school together. Even last year when my child was in, my daughter was in fifth grade and my son was in third grade, we lived about 10 blocks from their elementary school and they walked home. And there is, it is, it is glorious. I am not going to lie that not having to drive a kid to school or drive to three different school drop-offs, having a child who's 11, but who is really mature and savvy and street smart and all of her friends they walk to and from school together is really, really not only empowering for her, and just a really good lesson, life lesson for her to be able to get herself to and from places, I think, but also really freeing as a parent. I do not have to drive my kids all over to sports activities and everything all the time. There are a lot of places that when they get to be in middle school, they can get to on their own. And that is really, really freeing. I had a friend tell me once that if you can get through the little kid years, the tiny kid years, it gets easier and easier. And I'm starting, we're, we're kind of coming to the other side of that where our oldest is, you know, getting out of that phase where I have to take her everywhere. She can 
leave and go get a bubble tea with a friend and, and walk to a playground and sit and have, have some chatting time and come home by yourself and not having to drive her everywhere. I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel for that. And it's really great. It's great for her and it's great for us. That is nice. We live in a small, I I live in kind of central Houston and it's a small neighborhood, but the school, the elementary school is within walking distance and there are restaurants and there was a little grocery store. And it is so nice when they can do some of that stuff. I mean, of course, we're in Houston, which is a driving city. So there are many things that have to be driven to. But for those elementary years and like the close by restaurants and where they get their hair cut and all of that, it's just great that they can just bike or walk right up there. Yeah. It's great for you as a mom, not having to constantly be (laughs) on task. And good for them, like you said, to kind of learn some of those things, to navigate and to do it on their own. The other thing that throws me off a little bit, I have to say about New York City, is the people. Not not all of the people, but like in Texas, everybody is so friendly and that you, you speak to who you're standing in line with and you speak with the cashier and you chat and you know, you have these conversations and you touch on this a little bit in your book. And it's really not that way up there, or at least it's not always that way. It depends on who you get. And when I encountered a couple of interesting individuals when we were trying to gather some of her college stuff over the weekend, I laughed and I thought, oh yes, this is one of the things about New York that always kind of surprises me because people are not as friendly as they are here. Yes, that is true. And, you know, as I was talking to a lot of Southern book clubs or Southern bookstores when this book first came out and people would say, what do you miss about the South? And of course I miss people. I miss my friends. I miss my mom. There's certain food things that I miss, but I would say that is way up there is just chatting with the cashier at the grocery store or chatting with the woman at the front of the line at Holiday Ham. Uh, You always tend to have these sort of friendly conversations with people. And I think that's something as Southerners, we just grow up being able to do, kind of make that small talk. And it's something we enjoy. I'm learning that not everybody enjoys that. Like some people, that seems like such a waste of time. Like you're there to pay for something and move on. So I do miss that. I am with you. Having grown up in the South, I really miss that easy, friendly, quick kind of chatting or small talk. You are right that you do not get that. That's not a guarantee in New York for sure. At the same time, when we get on the bus, a lot of times, you know, at the front of the bus, there are seats that are reserved for people either with disabilities or elderly people that they reserve those seats for them. And almost always there is some lovely older man or woman who starts chatting with my kids or chatting with me. And we always do have those little interactions. So they are fewer and far between. But I think that they still do happen sometimes in New York, and I'm always really grateful for them. And I think my kids always sort of laugh at me a little bit because I do love to chit chat with strangers, but they have learned to do that too. And I think that will serve them well in in life. I do think that is a Southern trait that really serves you well in life is being able to just chat with anybody and be able to find some common ground and make small talk with anybody and be friendly and smile. And I think that that's a really lovely gift and a really lovely, you know, skill. And so I'm glad that my kids have it a little bit, having spent time in the South and they do get it occasionally in New York, but you're right. It's not a given. So I think New Yorkers, we just, we're busy. We have places to go. We don't have time to stop and chit chat. Yeah, it's just funny, but every place has, you know, their positives and every place has their negatives. So it just always kind of throws me off for a bit. Yep. Tell me about the title and the cover. Okay. So, you know, it's funny, the title it's called Good Apple and subtitles Tales of a Southern Evangelical in New York, which I think is pretty, speaks for itself. But the title Good Apple, when I sold this book, the title of the book was The Virgin Surprise. And I always, that is now the title of the first chapter. And I always knew that that was not going to be the final title of the book. I think my mother might have just dropped dead of a heart attack right away <laughs> when she saw that book come out on shelves. But At the time, we were sending out this proposal, and I didn't have a title, and I didn't know what, and my agent said, call it the Virgin Surprise. At the very least, it will get people to open the email. And I thought, okay, you're right. Let's do it. So we did. And I don't know if people opened that email from my agent that they might not have opened otherwise, but it certainly did get attention. But I knew that down the road, I was going to change it. So I brainstormed a lot of different ideas for a new title. And The title Good Apple was just, I I wanted to have a play on the Big Apple. Obviously, the book takes place, so much of it takes place in New York, and I have such a love for New York. And I think that often people do have not, not a negative connotation in New York, but there's a mystery about New York, or it seems a little bit overwhelming or a little bit big. And it's been such a place of goodness and a place of 
you know, love and family and growth and just wonderful things for me. So that was just kind of the play on the title. And as far as the cover goes, I have to say my publisher was so gracious to me because I don't think a lot of first time authors or maybe any authors, I don't know how, I don't know how much input people normally get on their cover. They were really nice and let me give a lot of input on my cover about what covers I liked, things I didn't like. And I, you know, I love that it has the skyline on it. This cover was, has a funny story behind it because it started out, I chose it because it started out looking very similar. It had sort of the apple blossoms on the tree. It had the skyline of New York. It was a different color. And up in the corner, it had a little sort of subtle, well, it was, I guess it wasn't subtle enough, a little rat bottom, a little hairy <laughs> rat bottom with a tail, which you have, if you've read the book, there is a mm-hmm. very pivotal chapter in the book about a rat in my apartment Um, I won't get into too many details in case it grosses people out. But the the bottom line is that rat grossed people out. When they went to the sales conference with my publisher, people did not like that rat. And that is why I chose that cover because I loved the rat. I loved it. And I thought it it gave it a little bit of an edge. I thought the book book cover looked a little bit like fiction. I wanted it to make sure it it read nonfiction. It looked a little fictiony to me. But I said, oh, but the rat, the rat butt really gives it that a little bit of edge, a little bit of humor, and a little preview of what's inside. And I thought it was so great. And then they took the rat butt off because people were really turned off by the rat, which I understand. I get it. But it was just no, like mass market. If this book's going to be in bookstores, people don't like rats. So they took it off. Well, then I didn't like the cover quite as much because I thought, oh, but the rat was my favorite part. So we changed the color of it to make it a little bit less sweet looking and a little less like a like a dreamy novel. It was kind of a turquoise color before. But that is the story behind behind the cover is it, it originally had a rat on it and I lost the rat battle. So they they listened to me and listened to me and were so patient with all of my suggestions. And then I finally I fought for the rat and I lost. I have to tell you that I was really glad I got to the rat part on the flight home because I did not know that rats could go up through toilets. And I think I literally the entire time I was going to the bathroom in my hotel or wherever else I was, I would have been the whole time worried about going to the bathroom because I really don't like rats. I don't know that I would have minded it on your cover. And that's a hilariously funny and entertaining cover story. But the rat part, I kept thinking, oh, my God, I had no idea that they came up through toilets. Yes. And for anyone listening, he did not come up through my toilet. That was not how the rat got into my apartment. But it is still a mystery. And I live on the eighth floor. And we are everyone in our building is still stumped about how that rat got into our apartment. But you will have to read the book to see how it turned out. But yes, we although listen, Cindy, here is the thing. And you know this because you have read that chapter is when I talk to my friends who live in Houston or Dallas or Charlotte or wherever. I hear so many worse stories. I had a friend who had snakes come up through her toilet pipe. I was just thinking that snakes do come up through toilets. And we've had frogs. Like we've been out of town for a couple of weeks and come back and had frogs in our toilet, but we've seen them. So at least, you know, there was the frog before you sat down to go to the bathroom. But I mean, and we have rats run along our back fence and stuff. So, I mean, it's not like rats aren't everywhere. It was just a toilet part of it. And I saw them in the subway a couple of times, as you talk about in your book also. And I always think, oh, there's a rat in the subway, you know, because that's kind of, I don't know, a New York connotation to me for some reason. But I just, the toilet part was what threw me (laughs) off because I was like, oh gosh, okay. And you know, it's so interesting on the covers because I get such a wide range of authors' opinions about cover insight. So some authors will say, you know, authors don't get any say in their covers and others will say, oh, I had so much say. And so it must just really vary by publisher is all I can figure out because some people seem to have a lot of say in their cover and others say they had absolutely no say. Yeah. Well, and I, listen, I'm a first time author. This is the first time I've done this. So I don't know if they were just being nice and really did not listen to me at all. I don't know, but I have to say they, they were very, they were very open to letting me say, these are covers that I love, or these are colors that I hate or anything like that. So I felt very, very lucky and taken care of, but I'm with you. I hear, I hear both sides. I hear people who Um, have a lot of it say. And I hear people who who say, oh gosh, you were so lucky that they even asked you. So I do feel very lucky. No, absolutely. It definitely seems to be the case. It just must depend on the imprint or the publisher or whatever, but it is nice. And I think it's a beautiful cover and it definitely is representative of your story, rat butt or otherwise. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Elizabeth, before we wrap up, I would love to hear what you've read recently that you really liked. Okay. So I, you know, I was, I was, in preparing for this podcast, I was listening to some past episodes and I listened to my friend, Julia Claiborne Johnson, who um, wrote Better Look Next Time, which book I loved and um, who I know. 
and she recommended the book that I was going to recommend. So I'm sorry, Julia. I'm sorry, Cindy. But I have to say one of my the my favorite, favorite, favorite books that I have read this year is Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. I read it a couple of months ago. And it's just, you know, the, the writing in this book, it's the story is sort of even secondary to me, even though I love the story too. And it ends on such a hopeful note, which I think a book like that, that has a lot of um, mental illness, a lot of broken marriage issues, and yet it ends on a hopeful note, which is really different and I think wonderful, but the writing, oh my gosh, every sentence, I just wanted to eat it and like swallow it whole and just hold it inside me and never let it go. I just think about it all the time, the, the way that she you know, bring sadness and humor together. And it's so sharp and every sentence is so perfect. And I just really, really loved that book. And the other book that I just finished was Anxious People by Frederick Bachman. It is not a book that I would say in the, at the end of my life is going to be in sort of my list of top books that I've read or top 10 books, you know, the past couple of years, but it was a book that I really needed at the time it came into my life. I had just read a really highly anticipated, hugely successful novel that I could not get into and I didn't finish. And then I read a really heavy memoir that was really tough to get through. And this book was just sweet and hopeful and just, I don't know, it had lovely characters. It, it Especially living in New York, you know, in, in this book, people are in a, a apartment showing, a real estate showing, and they end up in this traumatic situation together. And it's the relationship that grows between these people and also the relationship of all the people in the town around them. But I, it, it's I, as a New Yorker, you end up in situations like that. You get stuck on a subway train that suddenly stalls for a little while and you're stuck on this car and you're looking around at these people and being like, okay, if I'm stuck here for three hours, what am I going to get to know about these people? And how are we going to help each other or be there for each other? Or living in an apartment building, especially during the pandemic, living on top of each other and just looking in on each other, checking on each other, helping out our elderly neighbors in our building when it was hard to go to the grocery store. All of those things just really resonated with me with this book. It made me want to go outside and hug my neighbors. It made me want to, you know, be kinder to the strangers on the street. It was just a really sweet and lovely, a little predictable, but a really sweet and lovely book. And I just really enjoyed it. It is sweet and lovely. And it's really different than his other books. I love A Man Called Uwe. That's one of my favorite stories. Yeah. I and that. and I did like this one too. I did think it was predictable, but I did enjoy the community aspects of it a lot. It was just, it came into my life at a time when I needed something a little easier and a little sweeter and just fun and enjoyable. So, And those books are so nice because you just end with such a happy, you know, hopeful feeling. Yes. Yes. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me on the Thoughts from a Page podcast today. I really enjoyed speaking with you. It was my pleasure, Cindy. Thank you so much for having me. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please consider joining my Patreon as a page turner. Follow me on Instagram at thoughts from a page. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed today can be purchased at the Conversations from a Page bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. Thanks so much to my sponsors, the Young Center Houston and Maggie Garza of HTX Real Estate Group. They really help me continue to produce this podcast. I hope you'll tune in next time.
You might be surprised to know that not all serial killers are straight, cisgender white men, and the victims of true crime are not a monolith either. She's Wendy and I'm Beth, and together we host Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color, a true crime podcast. Together we take deep dives into the true crime stories about marginalized and minoritized perps and victims that often go untold. We also provide the context and nuance that these stories deserve. At Fruit Loops, we're serving up true crime with a side of history, society, culture, Culture and some fun. Listen to Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.